Okay, we've got our material here. And now we're going to start. We're going to start next time by talking about threaded holes. So we're going to put two holes in here. And they're located to edges. If you look at this, one is located here and one is located here. This one's located from this edge or located from this edge. If, there, if the hole is located from an edge or concentric to something else like a full round or something, then we can create this, the hole without a sketch. If two holes are dimensioned to each other, we have to create a sketch first. And it picks up all the points as holes. So we'll do that later. But I'm just going to type H is the alias for hole. Now, I have a simple hole. Now, a simple hole, and I'm going to turn this off. A simple hole has no taper, it has no threads. We can change its diameter. We can make it go just a distance, not through the entire part. This is through all, or it could go up to a surface. And most of the time, it's going to flip in the correct direction. Now, this is kind of cool that I can make it symmetric. So if I made it on a mid plane, I can make it symmetric through all the part. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that we have a clearance hole. And I'm just going to maximize this for a second. The clearance hole is for a certain size screw, a certain type of screw, and we have certain fits. So this is a simple hole that's made for a certain size screw to go in there. Do I want that to be a tight fit, a normal fit, or a loose fit? How important is it? All right, so it will, it already has its calculations, and depending on the company that you work with, you may want to change that in something called design data. Um, the next one that I wanted to show you is a, a threaded hole, a tapped hole. So a tap is a drill bit. You have to drill the hole first, and then you take this drill bit with the threads on it, and you cut the threads in. You cannot extract the material out before you cut the uh, while you're cutting the threads in. You have to drill the hole first, and then cut the teeth in. So this is called a tap. A die goes around the outside of a shaft and cuts the threads off the shaft. So this is a tapped hole. And I want to show you that there are all kinds of threads. Um, the nominal size, this is the major diameter of the thread. So if it's a hole, imagine you have teeth that are protruding out, but then there are valleys and that is your major diameter. It's the larger of the two. So in a hole, it would be the valley. And then imagine on a shaft, it would be the peaks of the teeth. That would be the larger diameter. So that's called the major diameter. That's what the size would be. And in our input, we'll look at that. But also, so the size is a major diameter. The designation tells you how many threads you have in an inch. So this makes this coarse thread if I only have 10 in an inch. If I go to 16, that would be more fine threads. They would be closer together and I get more holding power. And we'll be talking about that, an extra fine. Um, we'll be talking about those whenever we talk about threads. So the next type is a tapered thread. And I want to show you something about this. Do you see that it's not, this picture shows a thread only going so far. So if I had a distance that the hole goes, I could have a distance for the drill and a distance for the tapping of the threads. So how do I get that done? This one's going to go through all, and I want to thread it all the way through as well. So here's a little box. You want to have this on or it will put this dimension in. Even though the hole goes through all, it's tapped this far and you'll see a depth. So I'm going to go full depth right there. And you see that goes away. All right. So the next thing that we have is the class of thread. Now a B is 
uh, the B is for a hole. So remember, this is kind of funny, but it's like B hole, okay? That's a way to, that I remember it. A is for external threads. B is for internal threads, like inside a hole instead of outside on a shaft. The class we'll talk about, and class two is normal hardware store variety. That's mainly what we'll be using. We could have left hand or right hand thread, and depending on how something is moving, it may loosen. If you used right hand, you may want to go to left hand thread, and that would be specified on your input sheet LH after that thread call out. Now I could go once again a distance, and that's full depth of thread during that distance because I have that selected. I could go through all. Or I could go up to something else, which I would select. And most of the time, we don't have to flip this direction. It's going to try and go into the material. Okay, now that we've talked about that, I'm going to minimize this back down. And we see that we have a three-quarter ten coarse thread. So this is three-quarter is 0.75, right? So 0.75. You say what size it is. This tells you how many threads are in an inch, and that's how it's specified. And that would be coarse, 10 threads in an inch. Class 2B, that's even missing off the input sheet. So I would go back and ask what class of thread. Um, that could be 1, 2, or 3B. Right-hand thread, full depth of thread, and through the entire part. Now, the next part is that we have this flat bottom hole, or what a lot of people call a counterbore when they're a combination of two holes. That has a diameter of one. It has to be bigger than the thread, and that goes to a flat bottom depth of 0.125. So up here are our seats. We can make it a counter sink, a spot face, which we'll talk about later, or a counter bore. You want to use a counter bore. And notice that this is one, and then this is 0.125. And these are already here. If this came up and said 0.3, you see that it doesn't like that because that's smaller. This hole would be smaller than this, and it would be non-existent. So if I say one, then that went away. The depth of that... How far does it plunge is, and that's that little symbol right there is 0.125. And now that I've got all that specified, I'm going to select, because it's a counter bore, I have to select the face that the counter bore is going to be on. I can't do it from the back side. I have to do it from this side. And I'm going to offset this because this is very important. This will let you say, okay, without locating this hole. So I make it kind of offset and exaggerate it so I remember. So if it's dimension from the bottom edge, it says right there, create dimension from selected linear edge. So I'm going to select that one, and that is one inch up. Don't hit enter because it will finish the command and you won't have your X dimension. Select the left-hand side, and that is 1.125. And now it's completely, uh, the specifications for the hole are there, and it's completely located. Now, if I want to create another hole, I can hit plus and stay in the same command. So I do all, I kind of group features so that I can hit keep hitting plus and keep continuing. However, if you do that with an extrusion, it's going to try and use the same sketch for another extrusion. So I wanted to create another hole, and this one over here is a simple hole that has a diameter 0.875, and if it doesn't have a depth, it's assumed to go through all. So a simple hole with no seat, through all, and I'm going, it, I'm going to change this to 0.75. Now I'm going to locate that. So I'm going to select on this face somewhere. Just kind of a little offset so it doesn't, don't try and eyeball it to be perfect and then forget. Now it has two linear edges or a circular reference. 
So it is dimensioned from this edge, and it cannot be planes. It has to be edges. 1.25. And then from this back edge, don't hit enter, 0.875. Now what if I forgot to put the 0.875 in, and I hit enter? I could go back into that hole, double click, and add, select that, and put that dimension in. So I'm going to say OK to this one because I'm finished with all the holes. And that is through ball. And I can see it making a feature, so I don't need to flip it. If I flip it, I won't see a feature. So my part is complete. I'm going to save it. However, nothing is complete without a material because no one can quote that. Or you can't do stress analysis, and you can't find its center of gravity. So you see it's 1020 steel. Right here, this soccer ball allows you to adjust materials or create materials. We don't want to do that. We're going to select something that's pre-existing over here where it says generic. Hit the drop down. We're in the inventor material library, but it only has so many. So let's go to the very specific Autodesk material library. And it goes away, but it set it so that I can look at it again. So you see that set up? If I type S to go to the top of the S's, look at all the materials now. AISI, that's American Institute of Steels, and uh, are the, that's American Steels, and that's a 1020. Let's use the 107 hot rolled. This is annealed, and that, that, creates different properties in there. We're going to use a plain hot rolled ingot of steel. And then we're going to go to the appearance. If you go to the color wheel, you can change appearances for materials, select some weird appearance, but let's just select something. So if I hit that, I'm in the inventor material library. What if I want to just look at all appearances? I like the Autodesk appearance library. I click on that, it goes away again. Hit your drop down. And now I've got all kinds of stuff that could be used for Revit or whatnot. So I'm going to go here to swimming pool and movie stars. So there's my swimming pool. You can kind of see through it. Looks very inviting to go for a dip. And now that I have specified my steel and my appearance, I'm going to save it. Now I want to show you once I've uh, assigned the material, if you right click on the part name in the model browser, you go to the properties of that part. Now there's lots of stuff in here. The summary, who created it, the title, the subject. You can bring all this stuff into a template. How much the parts quoted as cost when it was created, what the part number is, the revision, lots of stuff for operations and procurement. But if you go to physical, Notice that it has the material here and the density, but it doesn't have mass area and volume. You hit update, and you can see the volume of material that it would take to make that. That makes it easy to quote. If you wanted to 3D print it in cubic inches, that's usually how that material is sold. You could find out what that would cost to 3D print. The last thing that I'm going to show you here is if you go to view, you can change the appearance, you can look at it in a section, but look at this center of gravity. There's the center of gravity of my part. And then I can turn it off. So I can turn on the center of gravity in an overall assembly, like I designed a display for Dell, and they had a tip test of like 12 degrees. If you tip it 12 degrees, it should pop back into place. So I had to put the center of gravity in the entire assembly. Therefore, I needed the materials. I needed everything in every part so that I could see where the center of gravity is and try and lower that as much as possible so that it would not tip over.